received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD in material science and engineering from UC Berkeley. After a postdoc in current material, which ranges from hydrogen storage to additive manufacturing to electronic materials and interfaces. His specific focus is on TEM STEM and FIB STEM based characterization, and it will discuss these and many other interesting techniques with us now. Thanks, Susie, for that very kind introduction. Thank you all for being here today. I'm excited to speak about this opportunity. Um, so today, the, the title of my talk is more than just a picture. And that's because I think that in today's um, scientific communities, we get signals, and, and very often, um, it's a picture that they show. Often, it's an electron microscope picture. And those pictures are very striking. And we remember those pictures, and they look great. And um, the thing is, um, for me, when I'm interacting with my colleagues often, they'll say, you know, thank you so much for that picture. And what I've tried to do in my career so far is really go beyond just the picture and show that we can do more with electron micro microscopy than just take a picture. And we can really be quantitative and get at the fundamentals of transport and materials using microscopy. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today. Um, there's a lot of people that help me with the work that I'm going to present to you today. First and foremost, Susie, um, she and I worked together for many years in, in, a different, in different capacities at Sandia. And um, sh she will see, you will see some of her work represented here today. And um, I'm, I'm very happy that she can work with all of you here and you get to experience what I experienced for the, the prior years. Um, in addition, her replacement, Warren York, I work very closely with him now, and he's trying to fill some big shoes. And so he's been doing a lot of work for me and working very hard on these things. And everyone else here, I'm not going to list everybody, but these are all people that help me. And so I just want to make sure that I give credit where credit is due. So for those of you that don't know about Sandia, um, it is a, a, the largest DOE lab. And it exists at two sites, uh, one in Albuquerque and one in Livermore. And our main mission is the stewardship and design of the non-nuclear parts of our nuclear weapons stockpile. And so in our nuclear weapons stockpile, we have multiple kinds of weapon systems. And in those weapon systems, we have lots of different kinds of components. We have safety devices. We have neutron generators. We have cabling. We have electronic switches and things that direct electronic signals to go from one place to another. We have explosive things inside of these systems. And in any one of these individual components, there's all aspects of material science, right? We have electronic materials, structural materials. We have metals, ceramics, polymers. And so in all of these things, one could spend a whole career just looking at one particular piece of one particular component in these weapon systems. And we really have to think about all of them. And we have to try and help guide design decisions and, 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 and make decisions on, on on how to help these things to make sure that they're safe. Because if these things don't work, there's serious consequences. And that's why we take our job very seriously. If something goes wrong, we can have an environmental catastrophe. We can have loss of human life. And we can have serious political consequences to things that don't work. And so um, um, that, that's, what I, I, that's what I do there. I try and help guide these decisions. And so we have two sites. One is in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where we have most of the, the Sandia employees. And there's about, say, 10,000 or so people there. Maybe that's a little overestimate. And in Albuquerque, we have lots of people, lots of great equipment, and lots of green chilies. Then the other site is in Livermore. It's much smaller. There's maybe 900 people or so. And that's where I am. And of course, I like living in Livermore, because depending on which window I look out, I have wine, um, wineries and beaches and mountains and cities. And so that's wonderful. And so. Come visit me in Livermore anytime, please. So I'm going to be talking about electron microscopy. And so to start, I thought I should um, just kind of talk about what, what do we get out of electron microscopy. So when we put a sample in the electron microscope, we have high energy electrons hitting the sample. And we get all kinds of different signals coming from that. right? So we have the elastically scattered electrons. And from those electrons, we can form images. And we can see where different phases are in a material. We can see where defects are in a material. right? We um, can take the elastically scattered electrons and form diffraction patterns, much like the diffraction pattern that's there. That's a uh, EBSD pattern. But we also can get spot patterns. I think m many of you are probably familiar with that. 
And we can look at the crystal structure and the arrangement of atoms, the atomic arrangement of atoms in a material. And we can also get inelastically scattered electrons and get lots of different information from that. So sometimes electrons go in and x-rays are produced. And if we look at those x-rays and what energy those x-rays have, we can tell what the, what, what the composition is, what kind of atoms are and where they're located, right? We can also have electrons going through the material and we can measure the energy that's lost in one of those inelastic scattering processes. That's EELS, electron energy loss spectroscopy. And if we measure the energy that's lost and look at that, we can also find out things about composition. We can find things about bonding. We can find things about the electronic structure of these materials. And so all of this information we can get from the electron microscope, from looking at a sample. And at the engineering lab, Sandia, people are trying to make decisions. And we don't always have all the information we need to make the best decision. And so my job is to help people make these engineering decisions. And electron microscopy is the tool that I like because electron microscopy applies to all the different materials I talked about, right? We can put any kind of material in, electron micro in an electron microscope and learn all these different things about it. And so people ask me, Josh, why did this fail? Josh, how should we build this so that it'll last for 30, 40 years? Josh, I just took this thing out of the microscope. Or, sorry, I took this thing out of the stockpile, and I need to know, can we reuse it? Can we recycle it? So all of these questions are asked to me all the time, and I have to try and use the tools that are available to me to help make the best decision we can. And so that's what I do, and I want to talk to you about how I can use the microscope to make these guided engineering decisions. Now before I jump into specific examples, I just want to talk about one particular kind of data analysis, because this is going to come up a few times in my talk. And that's multivariate statistical analysis. And so um, generally in the microscope, when we're doing some kind of spectroscopy, we can do something called spectrum imaging. So what spectrum imaging means is that if we have an image, so here's a 2D image, and at every single pixel in that image, we'll collect a spectrum, right? Some kind of energy signature of that material. And so in this um, 3D data cube, right, it's 3D because we have two pixels in two dimensions and then energy in the third dimension, okay? Well, we, we have all of this data that we have to try and understand, and there's a lot of information there. And so what we really want is some kind of automated way to take that data and make a more compact representation of it, okay? And, and sometimes we have no a priori knowledge about what this should look like. So sometimes you're looking at something, you know what elements to expect, you know where to look. But other times we have no idea. And so by using these mathematical techniques that all fall under the general umbrella of multivariate statistical analysis, but more specifically, it's principal component analysis, singular value decomposition, or multivariate curve resolution, okay, those techniques can give us an automated way to look at all the statistics of the data and find a compact representation that's easy to understand. So one very brief example I'll talk about is this picture of a pumpkin, okay? So here's a picture of a pumpkin. And we could think of an energy spectrum for that pumpkin as being the red, green, and blue channels. So here's an example of a red, green, and blue channel that come together to make this image of the pumpkin. And the point is that red, green, and blue may not be the best way to describe this pumpkin. So if we perform this type of analysis on this image of a pumpkin, here's the regular image that's red, green, and blue channels, right? The choice of red, green, and blue is somewhat arbitrary and related to, you know, uh, the phosphors that we had available when we were doing color imaging. But if we do this kind of analysis on this data, what we find is that the statistics tell us we only need two, com two colors to describe this particular image. And those two colors are green, which is the grass, the reflections of the grass of the pumpkin. And the other color is this brownish color, which is actually the pumpkin. So using an automated algorithm to find what's relevant in this image, we find Pumpkin and not pumpkin. And that's all that we need to do to describe this data. And if we then reconstruct that, that full data cube from those two things, we see that the red, green, blue image, which is here, doesn't look very different from that brown, green image. So we basically described all of the data with a slightly different color scheme. And, and it's much more physically compact, because there's two components instead of three. And um, we, without knowing anything about the data, the computer has told us what's relevant, what's important in that data. And so we can apply the same routine to 2,048 channels that you would have in an EDS or an EEL spectrum to understand what's relevant and what's a physically compact way of looking at that data. 
And so I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on in the talk. And I want to make sure we're all on the same page before I get there. So here's the topics I want to talk about today. And so the first topic I want to talk about is helium bubbles that are formed by tritium decay in metals. So one type of nuclear weapon is a hydrogen bomb. And tritium is a critical ingredient to this type of thing. So we have to understand how tritium evolves and decays in materials, because that's our job at Sandia, to be able to predict what's going to happen and to be able to understand um, how to manage the storage of this tritium in these materials. And so here's an example of a picture of this material. I believe this was even a, a piece of sample that Susie might have made. Maybe not. I don't remember. But um, if you look very closely, you can see these little white speckles in here. And those are bubbles. Those are helium bubbles that are formed by the decay of tritium in this material. And if we do an under-focused and an over-focused image pair in the TEM, what you see is that the bubbles change contrast. And that's because of the Fresnel fringe, the diffraction contrast in the material. So we have these bright bubbles here that become dark bubbles here. They're about 2 nanometers or so in diameter. And they're spaced about 10 nanometers apart. As, as, as tritium decays over its 12, 12 year half-life, more and more helium forms in, this, in these materials. And the helium collects in these bubbles. And the bubbles get higher pressure and higher pressure. And eventually, they could rupture. And as the pressure is building up in these helium bubbles, the properties of the material are changing. It's becoming stiffer and harder. And all these things are changing. And if this material were to rupture, we could have very bad consequences to our, 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 our uh, system that we care about. And so <clears throat> what we want to do is understand how these bubbles form and how do they evolve over time. Because we have to manage the storage of this tritium. And we have to manage the release of helium in these materials. And the early nucleation process is thought to define what happens for the rest of the evolution of these materials. Now, the problem is, if we just take these 2D pictures, right, we can't see everything that we need to in these materials. We get no information on the spacing in the z direction. Things can be overlapping, but because we're just looking in projection, we can't see anything. Things could be obscured. Some of the small bubbles may be difficult to observe. So, we need, to we need to develop a technique so that we can see these bubbles and really understand where they are in a three-dimensional space. And so the way we're going to understand that is with capture volume theory. And what capture volume theory says is that if all the bubbles nucleate at the same early time and, and they nucleate kind of uniformly and randomly in the material, right, and then they grow simply by a diffusion-limited process over time, then um, they should contain all the helium generated in the capture region geometrically nearest the bubble. So we can do a Voronoi tessellation. And here's an example of a 2D Voronoi tessellation where all of the points here would be an actual bubble. And then the, the area um, that, that the helium was sucked up to form that bubble would be by these dotted lines. That's the Voronoi tessellation. It's drawing these, these arbitrary lines around where the capture area of that bubble is. And so what we really need to do is test this in 3D and look to see if the smallest capture areas or smallest capture volumes correspond to the smallest bubbles. Because if we believe this theory that says all the bubble nucleation happens initially randomly in the material, then we should get a log normal distribution of capture volumes. And likewise, the bubble sizes should be a log normal distribution. So that's what we should look for. Okay. So the question that we're asking is, Right? Can we validate this model of the early nucleation and diffusion-limited growth of these bubbles? And so the way we're going to do this is we want to do three-dimensional microscopy to really see how big the bubbles are, what their shape is, and where they're located so that we can validate this model. So we're going to use electron tomography. So electron tomography is a technique that allows us to do three-dimensional microscopy. And so what we do is we start with a 3D object, much like a CAT scan. If you go to the doctor and get a CAT scan, what happens is we Rotate the sample one degree, okay, one degree at a time. And typically, we'll do 140 images with one degree spacings between them. So we start at plus 70 degrees tilt, go to minus 70 degrees tilt. We take an image at every single tilt. Then we take those images, and then we use a reconstruction algorithm to put those images back together to form what that three-dimensional structure is. And so what we did, and Susie will remember this one, okay, is we made a needle shape. Because this needle shape is very easy to align in the microscope. It's very easy to align all the, all the, all the images so that the, this needle is aligned in every single image so we can make that 3D volume. 
And so here's an example of a, it's basically a copper holder, bronze holder. And what Susie did is took our tritiated material, this little tiny thing up here, and in the fib, she put it on top of this needle, and then she sharpened it like a pencil. Now if we take that sharpened pencil and we put it in the TEM, we get an image like this, okay? And you can see these little dark things in here, those are all bubbles, okay? And so this is a um, tritiated palladium nickel alloy that's been tritiated for 3.8 years, okay? You can see the bubbles that are about two nanometers. And now if I show you all of the 140 images as a movie, you can see now how some bubbles are kind of rotating in front of others. So your brain is very good at this already. You're already able to see um, the three-dimensional structure of how these bubbles are oriented relative to one another. Okay, and some of this stuff out here, this is carbon contamination that we get inside the microscope because our chamber is not so clean. But you can make out those bubbles. You can see it. Your brain's really good at it. But what we need to do is digitize this information, right? We need to be able to have it automated in the computer. We take all these images. We do perform a, um, what's called a simultaneous iterative reconstruction technique where all those images are used to reconstruct together the volume of that material, and we end up with this. So here's the reconstructed 3D volume of those bubbles, okay? And what we've done is we've um, what you can also see, there's a little bit of elongation, like in that one there, and that comes from something called a missing wedge because we're not able to tilt the full 360 degrees, so there's some missing images that we don't have, and we have to kind of infer what's in those locations. But now we have this 3D volume of all these bubbles, and we can use this to validate our model. So here's an example of that Voronoi tessellation. So these gray volumes here, those are all the, the tessellated volumes around every, all of the bubbles, right? And if I show this here, then as this looking for. However, if we look at the um, bubble volume, we don't get a log normal distribution. So that's inconsistent with the theory. Because, right, so that means that, that for some reason some bubbles aren't growing or maybe they're not all nucleating at the same time. Something doesn't work <coughs> with, with our initial hypothesis. Another way to look at that is if we try to correlate the capture volume and the bubble volume, right, we don't get a line at all. We see that, that the data doesn't correspond at all to this line, okay? And if we just get rid of all those small bubbles, because we saw in the bubble size distribution that we have more small bubbles than we expect, we just get rid of those small bubbles, we still don't have a correlation. So something is wrong with our initial hypothesis that all the nucleation happens initially and then everything else after that is diffusion-limited growth. There's something else going on here, right? Which means that nucleation is probably happening always throughout the process. It means that for some reason, some bubbles are growing more than others, and it's not, it's not a, a uniform kind of bubble growth the way they, it sucks up the helium. Perhaps the bubbles are mobile and moving around. Um, so um, we don't really know why this is, and we're working on this. One thing we need to do is look at the pressure of helium in each of these bubbles. It turns out you can do that with eels, and we're working on that right now. Because if we could look at the pressure of helium in each of the bubbles, we might be able to find out why some bubbles are different than others. But what the, the, the point here, though, is that we were trying to understand transport phenomena in the, in the um, nucleation and growth of these bubbles, and it didn't follow our hypothesis. So we have to go back and use microscopy, and go beyond just that picture, and try and understand what's going on. So the next topic I want to talk about is rhodium ion transport during fabrication of nanoporous hydrogen storage materials. So I've just spent a lot of time talking to you about this problem we have with helium and managing the escape of helium in these materials. And so now what we want to do is be smart about how we manage that escape of helium. And so what we want to do is make a nanoporous material. Because if we have a nanoporous material, that helium can escape, and we can manage the escape of that helium over time. And so we have several different ways that we're trying to make nanoporous materials and nanoporous materials are not only beneficial for that reason, but we can improve surface limited reaction rates, say for catalysis, um, in addition to this releasing helium problem. Okay? And so what we want to do is make a uniform pore structure that's distributed uniformly everywhere in the material, and we want a stable pore structure over a wide temperature range. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about different techniques we're using to make these nanopore structures and how we're using microscopy to verify the compositional distribution of things to make these stable pore structures. Okay, so we're going beyond just the picture of the pores. So here's an example 
where um, we have a palladium particle that was initially nanoporous, and we did a heating experiment in the TEM where we heated it up to 200 degrees C for 12 minutes, and those pores all collapsed, and we end up with this dark particle that you can't see through anymore. Okay, so we've collapsed all the pores. The pores were not stable. Now, in this particle here, we mix palladium with rhodium. Rhodium has a higher melting temperature than palladium, so it's a little bit more stable um, from an elevated temperature perspective. And we heated it up for 30 minutes, and you can see these blue arrows are trying to point out these these pore channels that are running through this material, and those pores stayed stable. So that's what we want. And so the question we really want to answer with microscopy is where is that rhodium, okay, and is it uniform? And this is challenging for a number of reasons. So for one, palladium and rhodium overlap. The X-ray energies of those emitted lines overlap quite a bit, so that's hard. We're also looking at compositional variation at small length scales, you know, nanometers, hundreds of nanometers. We have to measure that. We're going to have very low count rates because these are thin materials, thin samples. And we have to prepare different forms that are particles. And particles are hard. I think many of you here work on particles. And when you have different scales, it's different. There's different techniques you have to use for different kinds of particles. And so I want to talk about all of those things. So we talked about um, um, MSA, multivariate statistical analysis. And so here's a specific example where I've used it in these materials. So here's this data cube again where we have an EDS spectrum at every single pixel. And here's a rhodium spectrum and a pure palladium spectrum. And you can see how much overlap there is there. And so if we look at what the raw data looks like when we do this type of analysis on our materials, it's this gray curve here that may be hard to see in the back. And I apologize for that. But you can see it's very noisy, this gray curve. Okay? It's a very noisy spectrum. And we want to be able to be quantitative and pull a lot of information out of that spectrum. And so by using multivariate st statistical analysis, we can actually combine the noise from every single pixel in our data cube and try and pull out all of those noise components that don't matter and aren't important to the quantification. So when we do that, it's basically an eigenvalue problem of a sparse matrix. We solve that problem. And what we find when we look at the eigenvalues, so this plot here is called a scree plot. It's a way of looking at variance in all the data. But if we look at this and we look at the value of the eigenvalues, you see that here we have a high value, here we have a little bit higher, and then all of these values here for all the eigenvalues, they're all roughly the same. That means that the data doesn't change much by, by using these eigenvalues in the problem. So we can get rid of all of these. So you just get rid of all these, and you, we only have to look at the first two. And when we look at the first two, we, we see that we basically have this pure rhodium component, this red, and the blue, which is the pure palladium component. So we can very easily see that the composition is non-uniformly distributed, and we can see that these are the only two um, spectra we need to worry about in this whole 2048 channel spectrum. So then what we need to do is quantify the amount of rhodium. So we reconstruct that data matrix, and we're going to use multi uh, a multiple least squares fitting routine to quantify the amount of rhodium. So what we have is a pure palladium spectrum. So we have a reference shape for pure palladium. We have a reference shape for pure rhodium. And then we have our unknown spectra at every single pixel in that data cube. And what we're going to do is we're going to solve for the intensities of these shapes that we need to make that unknown spectrum. And we use a technique called the cliff lorimer ratio technique, which is how we get this k factor. The k factor is a correction factor that allows us to convert from intensities to actual concentration. So that's how we're going to map quantitatively the concentration of rhodium everywhere in the material. Okay? We're going to use this series of techniques to denoise the data and pull out the actual concentration of rhodium at every single pixel in a map. And so the first material that we looked at with this is called a dendromer encapsulated nanoparticle consolidation. So this technique produces these little five nanometer particles. And these particles, we can, you, you can see an agglomerate of these particles here. Okay? And these particles, we can drop cast directly on a TEM grid. It's very easy to prepare samples for this. And the way this works is you start with this dendromer molecule, which is some organic molecule that has hydrophilic and hydrophobic components. And it's got these pockets in there, these hydrophilic pockets. So when we put it in a solution with metal salts and then reduce those salts, the metal will precipitate out in these pockets and make these little particles. And so we have two kinds of particles we were trying to make here. One was an alloy, palladium rhodium alloy. And one was a core shell structure, where we first would put in palladium and reduce palladium. Then we would put in rhodium and, redu and reduce the rhodium. Okay? Then we look at these agglomerates, and then we say, OK, where's, how is the rhodium distributed in these materials, and it is, is it exactly what we thought it should be? So I could use one of the fancy TEMs that we have in New Mexico. 
And I could do this compositional analysis with the EDS as I showed you. And what you see is that here, in that alloy particle, we end up having about, it's supposed to be about 10 atomic percent rhodium, and what we have is about eight and a half, nine atomic percent rhodium as we go across the particle. That's exactly what we wanted it to be. Well, not exactly, but very close enough. And then um, if you look at the core shell structure, you can see that we have a core shell structure just like we expect, where we have this low, maybe two to three atomic percent rhodium in the middle, and we have more rhodium out on the outside, which is exactly what we wanted it to be. So we were able to confirm that this process was doing what we wanted it to. The second technique that I want to talk about is um, it's called surfactant template fabrication. So again, we have this other organic molecule called bridge 56. So bridge 56 are these molecules that look like Koosh balls. And again, they may be elongated Koosh balls, I guess. And again, they have a hydrophobic and a hydrophilic component. And we put it in this solution of metal salt, so it's kind of like this pasty stuff in this solution of metal salts. Then we reduce the metal salts, okay? And then it makes these, these nanoporous particles like this. They're about 100 nanometers in diameter. We have some 50 nanometers, things like that, up to 100, 200 nanometers, right? So we've made the particles a little bit bigger now with this process. And again, we have this nanoporous stuff. And the idea is that the rhodium reduces with the palladium, and you end up with kind of more rhodium on the surfaces of the pores to make this stuff stable. So again, we want to look at how are the pores distributed in this material. It's getting a little bit thick in the middle, so we want to know are the pores the same all the way through this particle. And we want to know where the rhodium is. Now, <clears throat> because they're getting a little bit big, we have to figure out a way to thin them. This was before we had a fib, so what we use is conventional TEM prep, where we would take these particles and mix them into an epoxy resin, and then do conventional dimpling and ion milling. And when you do that, you section one of these larger particles, you can immediately see some problems that we have with this particular process. So first of all, just looking at a section of a larger particle, we see the pore structure is not uniform at all. We do have little pores around the outside, and you can see this kind of fuzzy surface where there's a lot of nice nanopores, but in the middle we have just these giant pores. It's not really what we want. The other thing is, if we look at the rhodium concentration, we can see that all the rhodium ends up being on the outer surface, right? It's right on the outer surface of this particle, and we really wanted the rhodium to be more uniformly distributed everywhere. So the, clearly there's some problems with these larger diameter particles. Now if we look at the smaller diameter particles that were made with this technique, okay, so these are the ones that are more like 50 nanometers or so in diameter. We can see that as we increase the amount of rhodium, we do get a more regular pore structure, which is nice, but the composition of these particles is still not what we want it to be. So if you look at these different particles that were all made with different concentrations of rhodium in solution, the nominal concentration that we measure of rhodium in these particles is higher than it should be. So in this particle here, it's supposed to be five atomic percent rhodium, but we're seeing kind of a 20 atomic percent rhodium content in that particle. Likewise, this one here is supposed to be 10, and we're seeing positions as high as 60%. You know, we see a lot of 20%, 20 atomic percent rhodium positions. And this one here, which is supposed to be 50 atomic percent, right, we see clearly there's places that are almost pure rhodium. So the concentrations are not what we think that they should be, which again comes down to transport during the processing. So we know from some simple experiments we did in the lab that palladium reduction happens faster than rhodium. And we know that nucleation of these particles is occurring all throughout the process. So when the first um, palladium nucleates and the first palladium particles nucleate, you end up depleting the region around them of palladium. And so you end up creating this rhodium-enriched environment near where the particle has nucleated. Which means that for these larger particles, once they get to the end of their growth, they're basically growing material now that's pure rhodium because all the palladium has been sucked up. Now any smaller particles that nucleate later in the process, right, they're nucleating in an environment that's enriched in rhodium relative to the nominal concentration. So that explains why smaller particles always have higher concentration of rhodium than what we thought. And so they have this higher concentration of rhodium, and then they end up with this rhodium shell. And so that really is a, is a transport understanding of what's going on after looking at the microscopy. So again, going beyond just the picture. So one last type of particle that we looked at here, and now we've, the size of the particle has gotten even larger. Now we're looking at bulk, kind of micron scale particles, because we have barrels of palladium of this, of this size, okay? And we want to say, well, what if we take this micron scale powder, can we modify the surface to make it 
you know, to, to put rhodium on there to make it more stable. And so we developed this electrochemical method where we can reduce the surface and then put electrochemically deposit the rhodium, and we can cycle this over and over electrochemically to put these rhodium layers on top of this, this, uh, the, these bulk palladium powders that are micron sized or so. But again, we have this problem now where micron sized particles are way too thick for TEM. So how are we going to see thin layers of rhodium on the surface? So the first thing we tried was the microtome. So at the time, we've been doing a lot of microtome. And so what we did is encapsulated these, par uh, these particles in, in epoxy, and then we microtoned them. And when you take thin slices of this and put in the TEM, we can see this rhodium is it, it's working quite nicely. We can see after eight electrochemical cycles, we have this nice 20 nanometer or so layer of uh, rhodium on the surface. And even if we do one electrochemical cycle, we can see this sub five nanometer, one nanometer or so layer of rhodium on the surface. So this process is working quite well. But then at the time, what happened was Susie started doing fib. And Susie was saying to me, Josh, can't we just do this in the fib? The epoxy samples, they just, they just don't seem as clean. And they're not as thin as what you want. She said, so let's try and do this with the fib. And so I, we started thinking about doing this in the fib. And if you think about ionization cross-section at 30 kV, which is what the accelerating voltage we typically use in a fib, versus 200 kV, which is what we use in a TEM, we thought, could we even measure these 5 nanometer layers in the fib? And if we think about the ionization cross-section and we look at the ionizations per electron that we get at 30 kV, we can see that for palladium, we actually get, we might e even get more counts at 30 kV than we would get at 200 kV. We might even do better at 30 kV than we typically do in a TEM. And so what Susie did is she developed a way to glue these agglomerates of these, these powders onto a TEM grid here. Then she could thin a a little, and I could look at that in a TEM. And when you do that, you very clearly can see in the TEM data, this 20 to 30 at 30 kV, we can see the same exact thing. So in fact, we can do this kind of analysis at 30 kV. So with new tools and modern techniques, we're able to do things that we didn't even think we'd be able to do. And if you go down to even the, the smaller layers of rhodium here, so here's a 5 nanometer layer. We can see that in the TEM very clearly. And if we look at a sample, unfortunately, the same sample broke, so I couldn't compare the same exact region. But in the FIB, we can also see these 5 nanometer layers of rhodium. So modern, modern microscopes, modern detectors, we really can do all kinds of things. They're, they're so powerful today. It's really amazing. And again, we've, I, I, I've shown that we can develop these tools to look at the compositional distribution of rhodium in these materials so we can optimize these processes and really um, go back to the processing cycle to understand how to make these things work to our advantage so that we can man make the right engineering choices. So now, <coughs> um, in addition to all the nuclear weapons work we do, because we know so much about engineering and materials and design, we also do some other things at Sandia. And so this topic I'm going to talk about here goes a little bit off the nuclear weapons topic because I'm going to talk about electrochemical energy storage. And we have a transportation center in Sandia. And at that transportation center, we do a lot of material science and gas phase chemistry where we look at combustion and we try to understand hydrogen storage for fuel cell ve vehicles and things like that. And so one of the things we looked at was lithium ion transport because you might want to put a lithium ion battery in a car. And a lot of the same problems you have when you do that are, is what you have with nuclear weapons. We need things to be reliable. We need things to be efficient. People can die if these things blow up on cars. So Sandia is good at these kinds of problems. And so we wanted to take a look at this and try and understand this. And so if you look at a typical battery electrode, what you have are these particles that are the electrode particles. They actually do all the work. And they're all bonded together with this polymer binder, right? And they're all held together. And here's an example of what that electrode might look like. And you look at this and you say, the, the, the fundamental question is, do all of these particles charge at the same time? So when you start charging the battery, do all the particles start filling up with lithium as you go? Or do the particles charge maybe you know, one after another in some different kinds of process? Because if you understand that, you can understand the rate. You can understand why, how the degradation me mechanisms are happening. And you can understand how efficient it is. So that's really the question that we want to ask. Right? How is this charging, fundamentally? And to answer that question, we need to be able to see where the lithium is. And this is a very challenging problem. Lithium is really tough. Because lithium is a light element. It's very hard to see where it is. Okay? 
So there's two ways you can do it. One is you can try to do in situ experiments, which involves making a little miniature battery and trying to wire it up inside the microscope and using these horrible volatile electrolytes in the microscope, right? And trying to watch it charge as you go. And people do that, and it's, it's phenomenal, right? Uh, but it's very hard to do. And so we chose not to do that. Instead, we did ex situ, ex -situ forensic analysis on the batteries, where we built batteries, right? And we convinced ourselves that we could charge them to different states of charge and suck all that electrolyte out really fast and that the battery wouldn't change. And so that's what we do. We charge it up to different states, pull all that electrolyte out, and then we go and look at the electrode, try and understand how it charged. And as I said, lithium's really, really hard because it's a light element. So you can't use Z contrast, right? We can't just use backscattered electrons or something like that because you can't, you can't see lithium, okay? And you can't use EDS because the X-ray emission is way too low in energy for modern detectors. There's maybe one detector on the market now that can do it, but it's really not ready for prime time. And back when we were doing this, that wasn't available. So eels seems like a good choice because you can see um, lithium with eels. And here's an example of some eel spectra for different forms of lithium. The problem in a battery material is that in this energy range where lithium has these peaks, all of these other transition metals also have peaks. And those are the common transition metals used in battery electrodes. So we have to figure out a way to either separate them or figure out what's going on there. And that's very challenging. But it turns out indirectly, if we look at the iron signal, OK, so here's the iron signal at uh, se around 710 EV, then there's this shift in position of that iron L absorption edge, which is this peak here. So it's about a 2 EV shift. We can measure that shift. We can see what the valence of iron is. And then we can map indirectly where the lithium is. Now, one challenge is, is that this was done by a French group with a monochromated electron beam, which means a very high energy resolution electron beam. And 2EV is kind of on the border of what a non-monochromated beam can do. So the question is, can we do this with a non-monochromated system? Because we have much more access to non-monochromated systems. And so what we did is we took some lithium iron phosphate and we soaked it in some oxidizer to chemically change its state from the iron valence from plus 2 to plus 3. And then we put it in the microscope and we could measure this, this 2EV difference. So this looks promising, right? We're going to be able to see indirectly where the lithium is. Now one problem, though, is that there's, the electron beam can often cause damage in these materials. So here's an example of some electrode particles. And if you can see that black dot right there, that's where we, I focus the electron beam to try and measure the spectra. And in the first spectrum, you can see that we have this spectrum like this, where we can see the iron L edge where we expect it. But then I collected a spectrum every second for 50 seconds. And at the end of those 50 seconds, two things happened. One is it dug a hole. So that dark spot is a hole in the material. So the signal went way down, right? And the second thing is that th there was actually a shift in the position of that peak by about an, uh, an EV, which means that we, um, we, we reduced the iron with the electron beam. So this is not good because this, this could change our results. So we had to think about ways to reduce the amount of beam dose that these materials would get so that we would still be able to measure where the lithium is. Okay? So this plot here is showing you um, the fluence, which is basically the electron dose as a function of time. And in a typical stem eels experiment, what you would do is you would put the focus probe in one position, measure an eel spectrum, then move to the next posi position and measure an eel spectrum. And the thing is, I looked at all these different op electron optic settings that I could use on our microscope. And I looked in the literature and found that this beam dose in this yellow bar, that's where you get damage in these materials. And no matter what settings I used in the microscope, I was always going to have beam damage after a second or less. So that's really not enough time to do these experiments. So I needed to think of a way that I could kind of extend the life of these materials and not cause damage. Whoops, sorry. So the other way to do it would be using f chem spectrum image, imaging. So the way that works is I can get the same data that I get here, but instead of measuring one pixel at a time and moving, I measure an entire energy plane at one time. So here I've spread the beam out, and I can change my condenser lens setting to, to spread that beam out to a large area. Okay? And then I can put in an energy selecting slit so that I'm only imaging one energy of that electron loss spectrum at one time. Right? And then I can measure an image. Then I can move that slit, measure another image, move that slit, measure another image. And in that way, I can build up the same kind of spectrum that you get here. Now, the problem is I lose a little bit of energy resolution in doing so, but I can reduce the amount of, I, I also have to deal with very low signal because I've spread the beam out, so I have less signal. But 
I can change the size of the beam and extend the time that I can collect this data past one second. Okay? So that, that, that was the issue, and that's how I collected this data, to try and map where the lithium is. And so to make samples, we used the microtome again. Again, this was before we had a fib. And when we did try fib, we had a little bit of problem with redeposition, um, which I'm sure Susie could probably fix. But um, so um, what we did is we took thin slices of this electrode, right, and put on a TM grid, and here's what it looks like. So here's that current collector, right? And then here is this polymer and particle uh, um, um, stuff, which is the electrode, which is all here. And so we can look at these particles and map where the lithium is. And so when we do it, it works, right? We can see where the lithium is. And so this map here is showing you these particles, right? So here's a bright field image, okay? You can see uh, that the valence of the iron is shown by color here, okay? And so um, you can see here, one, that the bright field image was not enough, right? We would never be able to see this with just a bright field image. But we can actually look at the TEM images here and the, and the, the FTEM maps, and what we see is that the particles pretty much are either in a red state or a green state. Right? You don't see a lot of yellow. And we could even confirm that this data is, is working how it's expected because some colleagues of mine went to the advanced light source at Berkeley, and they did the same measurement using scanning transmission X-ray microscopy. So they used X-ray absorption. They did the same thing. Now, the problem with X-ray absorption microscopy is you lose the, the spatial resolution. So they cannot make out individual particles here. But they can do the chemistry just as well as I can, even with thicker particles. So there's some advantages there. And we get basically the same result, right? We get the same result. And so the point is, we look at this. I'll also point out that when you do multivariate statistical analysis, with no prior knowledge, what does that, that kind of data analysis pull out? It pulls out an iron in a plus 2 and a plus 3 state. It tells you that's all you need to worry about. Right? And we can do multiple least squares fitting. That's what this is. And again, we fit it to a plus 2 and a plus 3 state. So we can very nicely see what state of charge all the particles in, are in. And the fact that most particles are either in one or the other. Here's another example of that data, a little bit larger area. Again, you see red and green particles. You don't see a lot of yellow. Okay? And here's all these different maps. This is all from the Stixum. So we combine the Stixum measurements with um, TEM measurements to see where the particle boundaries are. And when we look at all these, about 500 particles or so, we find only 2% of them are in a mixed state of charge. So what does that mean? That means that the particles are not charging at the same time. It's kind of like popping popcorn, right? That once a particle starts charging, it charges very fast. And it means that it's this stochastic process where these particles are kind of charging. You know, they're kind of like over here, over here, over here. It's like pop, 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 pop. And um, it, it means that the nucleation barrier is really the thing that's going to control the rate of charging in these materials, right? It's that barrier that controls when the particles can start charging and how many particles can be charging at any particular time, OK? And so then we did another experiment where we just turned up the rate of the charge, right? We just crank it up, say, let's charge as fast as we can, see what happens. And when we do that, you see that just more active particles are charging or discharging at any time in the process, right? So here, instead of 2%, you're seeing 20%. 30% of the particles are actively charging. And that's just because we cranked up the overpotential on the battery, right? And so to keep up with that overpotential, what the electrode did is it just was able to nucleate that phase transformation in more particles at once to keep that going. But the point is that the rate of each individual particle is not changing, right? That is not changing when you charge the battery. So if we want to change, if, if we want to understand degradation, in these, in these battery electrodes. We need to understand why would that barrier change, right? Something about that barrier is going to change. It's going to change that stochastic process. And if we want to make it more efficient, we need to lower that nucleation barrier, right? That's how we can get more of these particles to charge at one time and speed up the rate. But the rate of the individual particle is not what's important here. So again, we went beyond the picture to be able to understand transport in these materials. So. Um, the last example I'm going to talk about is going to go back to kind of the nuclear weapons applications again. And it's going to be more about manufacturing. So this is kind of the most applied type of work that I do. And I'm going to talk about the reliability of age electronic components. So here's an example of an electronic component. And we have all this glass down here. And then we have this, this wire that has this pin up here. And then there's this aluminum wire bonded to that. And so what happened was, we were doing some tests.
Somebody pulled this out of our shelf somewhere. Okay, and they measured this and they said, man, that contact resistance isn't right. That's much higher than we thought it, thought, thought it should be. That, that, that's not right. We need to look at that, okay? Something's not right here. And they came to me and they said, Josh, can you figure out what's going on here? Okay, because <clears throat> the thing is, um, this had been out in the field here, but on the part where we were having problems, you can see these black lines, which is kind of what I, what I would say looks like mud cracking. And we want to know, so why are these different? Does the mud cracking have anything to do with it? So that's what we have to investigate, and we have to understand. Is it the manufacturing and the environment, or the environment? What is it? What caused this? And so the first thing we did was we cut into these parts uh, with the FIB using cross sections. And so if you cut into this, uh, this, this pin here where the gold is plated on top of the kovar, and we use ion channeling, so these are ion channeling images, so you can see the contrast of the grain structure within the kovar. And what you see is that the grain structure in this material is about a micron. Okay, it's about a micron. So we look at that, we say, okay, so that's normal. That's what normal should be. So what about this weird part? Does it look like that? And you say, wow, that looks pretty different, right? You look at that, you look at the grain size here, it's, it's multiple microns, maybe five microns. You say, well, that's weird, that's already different. And that suggests that the kovar experienced a different thermal history, because that's how you would get different grain structure, right? So that's key. There's a different thermal history in the kovar. The other thing is, you look at this, and you can see that the, the gold plating has gone down into these grain boundary grooves in the material. And you say, oh, well, that's interesting too. Why would that happen? So we think about this for a little bit. And we say, well, the environment that these things are sitting in, things don't get hot enough to cause this type of grain structure. So that grain structure change can't be due to the environment. And you say, so, so what could cause that? Well, maybe the lot of kovar we got was different. Right? Maybe something happened in the drawing process that made that grain structure bigger. I suppose that's possible. But during the processing here, I showed you all that glass. And what we have to do when we're fabricating these things is make a hermetic glass to metal seal. And so um, if we imagine that something during that glass to metal seal process might have gone wrong, where something needed to be at elevated temperature longer to make that glass make a nice hermetic seal, then we can say, OK, maybe now we can start to understand why this part was different. So the first step in making a glass to metal hermetic seal is to oxidize the surface of the kovar, because that, oxi that oxidized layer is going to make a good bond with that glass. So we do that. We make the glass to metal seal. Then we have to clean off the oxide on the parts we want to plate with gold. So when we clean off that oxide layer, we now have two different grain structures, right? So if we have a normal part where the glass to metal seal went good, we have another part where the glass to metal seal got screwed up and something had to be done for a longer period of time. So now when you put this in this etching uh, cleaning solution, you have fewer grain boundaries, and those grain boundaries are going to be preferentially attacked. We're going to have intergranular corrosion of those grain boundaries, which means now when we do the gold plating, the gold's going to go down, and it's going to penetrate into those grooves that were made by the cleaning process. And so now what I'm going to show you are cross sections of this interface between the aluminum wire and the gold. Okay, and I'm going to show you here. We're looking at it with the SEM, and the fib is going to cut from the top. And I'm going to show you what that interface looks like. Okay, So we're moving through this thing. Okay, And you can see, sorry, the mag changes a little bit. You can see this is the interface here that we care about. So you can see a nice, continuous um, gold aluminum bond here. Okay, And that's what a good part would look like. So when, when all this goes well, everything's good. Now if we look at a bad part, okay, same thing. We start looking at it. right? We go through here and we see it, and what we can see when we get to more of the interface, if you start, you can start to see it here. You can see there's gaps, okay? There's all these gaps between the aluminum wire and the gold. And there's all these defects down here, right? This is, this is those grain boundary grooves that were etched. So we see there's all these weird problems and defects that we have from, from the manufacturing process going wrong, right? We have all these defects and gaps here, and here we have this nice continuous interface. So the hypothesis was, well, if these gaps are causing an electrical problem, they're probably also causing a mechanical problem. And we said, so let's look at the strength of these interfaces and see if they're weaker. And if they're weaker, then we could say, OK, then this reduced contact area is probably what's making the higher resistance, and that's what's causing our electrical problem. So we did mechanical tests where we bonded our little puller to these wires and pulled on them and looked at, looked at the strength. Okay, and when we did that, this is what the data looked like. So we got something that was about 6 grams as the average failure load which is exactly 
what it should be, right? If we look 35 years ago when these things were made, the average failure strength is six grams. So most of the time, these things haven't changed. But we had two samples that failed at lower fail strength, failure strength. So, so we wanted to know, okay, what is going on with these two outliers? Now it turns out that one of the outliers was our weird part. Okay, so that's interesting. So we had a problem with this part. The other outlier was this one. And what's interesting about this one is that if you look at that aluminum wire, you can see that it's been smashed down. It looks flat, right? We look at this one, we have this nice round wire, and here's where it was bonded to the gold, right? And that looks very different from this one. So this one failed too at a lower strength. Now the problem was that our hypothesis could not be correct because all the failures occurred in the wire. They didn't occur at that interface, okay? So if we look at the wire, here's a good wire, and what happens when you pull on these wires is you have nice, smooth necking up to a knife edge, and then it fractures, okay? And here's what the fracture surfaces look like. But when we look at that bad part, where we had bad electrical performance, it looks very different. We don't see that same sharp knife edge, number one, and number two, we see this very strange looking divot on one side of the wire, okay? And if we investigate that divot more carefully, what we see are there these little channels along that, that edge there uh, where that divot is. And in the bottom of those channels are little silicon precipitates. So this is an aluminum silicon wire, okay? And these silicon precipitates seem to be collecting at the bottom of these channels, and that seems to be where the cracks are initiating. So we have some problem now with silicon precipitation in the, in the wires. And so, again, we know that all the failures uh, the low load failures were consistent with some kind of additional deformation in that aluminum wire, right? In one case, the aluminum wire was completely flattened, and in the other case, we saw this additional divot in the aluminum wire that shouldn't be there. Now, how is that related to the silicon precipitates? Well, first of all, we know that the silicon precipitates are the, are the crack initiation site. So the low load is caused by this deformation and additional silicon precipitates. And we also know that if we look in the literature, um, dislocations are going to be nucleation sites for those silicon precipitates, right? So we know that deformation can cause additional dislocations, and those dislocations now can be the, the nucleation sites for where these silicon precipitates are going to form. And if we look at this divot and look at, look at what's on the surface of that divot, we see evidence of gold there. So that makes it look like when somebody was doing this, uh, this wire bond, they pushed the wire onto the gold, and it maybe didn't stick, and then they had to push it again. And in pushing it that first time, they deformed the wire, introduced a lot of dislocations, and that was where all these silicon precipitates formed. So what does that mean? How do we now understand the transport and the electronic properties that changed over time? Well, we can understand it as this whole cascade of events, all coming from the manufacturing process, right? So first, we had this problem with the thermal history of the Kovar where someone tried to do a glass to metal seal and that Kovar was heated too, too high for too long and the grain structure changed. Then when this Kovar was cleaned for the electroplating, though, because we had fewer grain boundaries and larger grains, we had intergranular corrosion, right? And we caused all these grain boundary grooves to form in the material, which meant that when we put the gold plating down, we now had this mud cracked gold plating with this roughness to it, this topography that was different, that was not like all the other parts. So then, Somebody was trying to do the wire bond, and you had this rough surface that you were trying to wire bond to that was not standard, and it didn't stick the first time, right? They tried to push down on it, and it didn't stick, and they said, geez, I got to do that again. So they did it again. The problem is, is that that introduced dislocations into the wire, which caused silicon precipitates. And so now, now, why 30 years later do we see different electronic performance? Well, one, those additional silicon precipitates there are scattering centers for the electrons. So those additional silicon precipitates that formed over time are a source of higher resistance in these parts. And number two, we have all these defects at the interface, right? And it turns out there's a lot of organic crud on these surfaces that results from the plating process. And, and if you just open one of these things to air and let it sit, all this weird um, kind of fractal looking carbon junk grows on the surface. And so this junk, when this stuff is all sealed in here, this junk is collecting at these um, voids and defects and also adding resistance to the process. And so it turns out that this variab variability in the manufacturing process that was kind of hidden for decades can all come together and decades later cause um, problems that we can observe when we go beyond just the picture and use electron microscopy to try and be forensic um, um, investigators about what's happening. So uh, just to wrap up here, we've talked about a lot of things. 
We talked about um, tritium decay in materials and, and making nanoporous materials to allow that helium that builds up after that decay to escape. We've talked about transformations in lithium ion battery electrodes and how it's all nucleation limited in this particular electrode. So if we want to make it more efficient or, or uh, more reliable, we really have to understand that nucleation barrier and how it changes over time. And we talked specifically about an electronic component and how manufacturing issues can cause problems decades later in the use of one of these devices. And so if I conclude here, and I think I'm right on time, but if I conclude here, I think that what I've hoped to have shown you is one, that by going beyond the picture, we can really understand fundamentally transport phenomena in all kinds of different materials. And so at Sandia, that's really what my job is, to use these tools and to help people make informed engineering decisions by going beyond just the picture. But also, I think um, the scientists at Carnegie and I, we share a lot, actually. And what we share is that I care about the evolution of materials. That's really what I'm trying to do, understand how these materials are going to evolve, how the properties are going to evolve over time. But the time scales that I care about are decades, because the systems that I'm responsible for are in our stockpile, say, for 30 years, 35 years, things like that. And you all are looking at things that have aged for millennia. And so I think that we really care about the same thing, the same kinds of evolution. Uh, it's just the time scales that are different. And I think that's very interesting and exciting just to be part of a community. In one way. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. My, uh, uh, back to your uh, helium bubble uh, forming, and has, so have you looked at the uh, different time uh, age the materials? Because that sounds like the key to understand and uh, small bubbles and large bubbles, how they mi migrate, right? Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, that's a good question, and you're absolutely right. The challenge there is that it's very hard um, to get material. So. The only place where we can get tritiated material is Savannah River. And it typically takes us 10 years to kind of get a sample. And so we talk about that very much. We want to look at different times. It's just very difficult because we have to plan today for something we'll be doing five to 10 years from now. And that's just a, that's just a challenge in itself. How do we make sure that people are still going to be here who remember the experiments that we planned, right? Because we'll move around all the time. So, so we, we really do want to do that. But it's very hard, lucky, to get this material, this this, uh, uh, the 3.8 years age stuff. It turns out it was aged for 3.8 years in tritium, and then it sat around for a long time, right? So it was actually kind of safer because we could be sure all the tritium had come out by that time. But it's just, it, it's just, it's just a challenging experiment because of the, because of the danger of tritium. What the initial, uh, like how uniform the hydro, the tritium in palladium, tritium is? to start? Um, I, I don't really. Um, you know, we, we think it's pretty uniform. We, th we, we think that defects play a role as a trapping site. So we expect that dislocations and grain boundaries and things like that would be a little bit worse. And it's actually interesting. This material, if, you, if, you, if I showed you an SEM picture of what the raw material looks like, you know, it starts as like a ribbon. But when it ends up, it's like these blocky chunks that seem to have pulled apart along certain grain boundaries or something like that. So it, it's very interesting, but, but I would say no. Th I mean, this material, you know, I, I probably didn't work at Sandia. I, I might have still been in diapers when this material was originally made. So what about palladium hydride? So, um, the, so palladium hydride we know more about. And I think that we probably don't know exactly where the hydrogen is because knowing where the hydrogen again is one of these difficult things. Hydrogen is a light element, right? Um, so we think probably most of it's on the surface and most of it's at defects. But I don't think we have any direct evidence for exactly where it is right now. I just wonder how long does it take to collect those uh, five micron cube uh, 3D images? Um, so. Yeah, so um, with modern detectors, it's a, it actually can be very fast. So with my old 22-year-old microscope, typically we're looking at anywhere from 45 minutes to a couple hours. Uh, but with the new microscope, the thing, things are very advanced today. 
cha it's changed a lot in the last five to ten years, actually. So I don't know if you can even answer this, but uh, so you find out that there were manufacturing issues of these components 35 whatever years ago. What happens now? Do they go back and look at every? <laughs> that is something that is under. It, it's a, it's a point of discussion. <laughs> and is that the kind of thing, can, so I mean, can you go back to the manufacturer and find other components from the same time and sort of do a... Right, so the manufacturers are long gone. So we can't really do that, but what we, and, and our notes are not always as good as we'd like them to be. But what we can do is we, we try. We try to trace it back, we try to trace it back to lots, and to, 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 the, to the extent that that information is available, we can make informed decisions of what to, do ne what to do next. But often, and most of the time, I would say, we don't have that information. And so we kind of have to do more work and wait for more things to come out so that we can understand, is this something that comes up a lot, or is this just a single singularity? But, but that is a very challenging issue that we are always dealing with. And one more thing, is uh, your new boss spending a lot of time in the lab looking over your shoulder? So, um, uh, Rick Perry. Oh, <laughs> um, no, not not yet. But but we do have a, uh, a, a, a we all have to take mandatory dance lessons. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We don't we don't have to. Do that. 